It's been a while since I tested a large size monitor and I do think it was worth waiting. Today we're looking at the Philips Evnia 42 M2N 8900 which sports a whopping 41.54 inch 138Hz 4K OLED panel. It does also have support for adaptive sync technologies, HDR and also has got those fabled HDMI 2.1 ports. You've also got Ambiglow technology at the back of the monitor. Now at the time of filming and in the UK it can be found for roughly £1,300 to £1,500 while in the US it can be found for roughly $1,100 to $1,500. So in this video which has been sponsored by the manufacturer I'll be covering everything you need to know about it so that you can make your own informed purchasing decision. So jumping straight in let's talk about its input lag. And here I had it objectively tested at just 0.2 milliseconds which is seriously impressive. Now note this figure was attained with the low input lag mode enabled via the monitor's OST and it's running at its maximum refresh rate of 138Hz. I had no means of actually testing it at lower refresh rate ranges. Now here I would like to also point out that if you do have adaptive sync technologies enabled such as AMD FreeSync or Nvidia G-Sync, be it if you're on a computer or a console, it will grey out the low input lag mode via the monitor's OSD. However, all I can say is from my own subjective testing, it didn't seem to overly impact the overall input lag that this monitor can actually attain. Now while that's all very impressive, it actually gets even better, because this monitor operates a OLED panel, which is extremely responsive. Indeed over here via the OSRTD tool you can see that at the bottom left hand side of your screen the average initial time sat at just 0.68 milliseconds. This translates to the average D to G which is often quoted by manufacturers. Indeed it hit 100% of the 138Hz refresh rate window. Now for those people who are aware of the OSRTD tool or indeed my other reviews you will be actually a little bit worried to see the RGB overshoot which is actually red. However, do not fret, this is just due to the limitations of my tool and also the overall brightness fluctuations that occur with an OLED panel. I'll demonstrate this just further down with a UFO ghosting test. Now switching to 120Hz, which might be of importance to console gamers, you can still see that it's actually phenomenally low with its average initial time, clocking in at just 0.65 milliseconds. Now I couldn't get some conclusive data at 60Hz, however from some of my tests that I did via the OSRTD tool, it does actually do a phenomenal job as well. Indeed very much similar to what you'd experience at 138 or indeed 120Hz. Therefore for console gamers you'll be pleased to know that it is actually very fast even at 60Hz. Speaking of which over here you'll be able to see the UFO ghosting test. And therefore re-emphasizing my point that I was making before, that there is absolutely no inverse ghosting, which is what you should come to expect with an OLED panel. At 138, 120Hz or even 60Hz, you'll be able to see that from the darker or lighter shades, there are absolutely no trails that go behind the UFO. Furthermore over here, you'll be able to see the overall motion clarity. And indeed it is a little bit better at the higher refresh rate ranges than at the lower refresh rate ranges. Now on that note, the monitor has got a Visa Clear MR8000 certification. As you'll be able to see over here, it kind of sits slap bang in the middle of the Clear MR tiers. This also gives you a little bit of an indication if you're comparing and contrasting in terms of the overall motion clarity in comparison to some of the other products out there, including those that are offered from Philips themselves. Speaking of which, the monitor has not got any sort of motion blur reduction technology, like you'd find on some IPS VA or TN LCD panels. But that said, the same could be said about other OLEDs out there on the market, at least at the time of filming. Now when it comes to the overall adaptive sync technologies, it does not have a native G-Sync module. And therefore its VR range goes from 48 up to 138 Hz. Indeed it has got AMD FreeSync Premium. Now in my case I've got an Nvidia RTX 3080. And when connected over a display port or HDMI, thanks to its HDMI 2.1 port, both on the GPU and also the monitor level, I was able to run the NVIDIA Pendulum demo without incurring any sort of black screen issues or flickering. Furthermore, I was also able to go in a game such as Destiny 2, running 138Hz, 4K with NVIDIA G-Sync enabled and also HDR. Indeed, all of the technologies worked in tandem without any sort of problems. Now this does perfectly bring me onto its HDR performance, and here the monitor does accept an HDR signal as it's HDR10 compliant. However, it's worth considering that it does not have any sort of display HDR certification, unlike some other OLED or mini LED monitors out there on the market. So some food for thought if you're comparing and contrasting. 
On the flip side, it does indeed have a OLED panel, and therefore its contrast ratios are pretty much unmatched. It is worth considering over here that if you are able to run an HDR signal, you'll be able to get the most out of this monitor. And that's because over HDR it will get up to roughly 480 nits, while in SDR it's capped at around 180 nits. So of course, if you have got the ability to enable HDR, for example in a game or while watching a movie, then certainly it's something that you might want to consider doing. Now to round off, I would like to point out that there are two full bandwidth HDMI 2.1 ports, and therefore it'll be very much pleasing to console gamers who want to output 4K at up to 120Hz. Of course, you can cap it at 60Hz or indeed go for a different resolution. Furthermore, via the monitor's OSD, you can almost force a console mode per se via the HDMI ports by limiting them to 120Hz rather than the maximum 138Hz. On that note, there are certain things that you should consider before buying an OLED such as the burn-in effect. Now here you have got the warranty, but you do also have a means of mitigating the burn-in thanks to screen maintenance. Now this is actually provided via the monitor's OSD. And here you'll be able to see that you have got a screen saver and pixel orbiting option, which are recommended to be left on. And then you have also got a pixel refresh and a panel refresh. Now in terms of the pixel refresh, it'll be, have to be done every four hours. You can ignore it, but up to 16 hours of cumulative usage, it will have to be done. Now thankfully this can be done when the monitor enters a standby state, or indeed if you power off the monitor. As for the panel refresh, it's a lot more intensive, and here this will have to be done every 500 hours. Yet again it can be done when you have the monitor off, so therefore you're not going to have any sort of downtime. Following on from that, and to protect the overall OLED panel, there is also a pretty aggressive automatic static brightness limiter, and therefore means that the monitor will constantly be adjusting brightness, for example if you have a pop-up window, or indeed a browser, and if you're minimizing it, or indeed maximizing it. It's something you'll be able to notice, for example, if you're using it for desktop usage, however it isn't something that's going to be inherently apparent if you're going to be, for example, gaming, or indeed watching a movie. Elsewhere, you should consider text legibility, specifically if you're going to be using this monitor for productivity. And I'm not just referencing the overall form factor and size of this monitor, which sits at 41.54 inch, 16 by 9 aspect ratio, and a resolution of 3840 times 2160, therefore giving it a pixel density of 106.06, .06. but rather the actual subpixel layout because here the overall text might not be as clear, at least to your eyes, in comparison to a traditional LCD display. For example, over here I'm comparing it to my AOC AG274QS, a 300Hz 1440p IPS display, and here hopefully you can see that the differences are pretty stark. So with that in mind, how does the monitor actually look like? Well, apart from the overall pixel density, the resolution, its form factor, and indeed the sub-pixel layout of this OLED panel, it is also worth considering that it has got a matte coating to it, which is certainly appreciated if you do not want any sort of reflections. This is very much apparent if you have got a very bright sunlit room. Now there is actually a little warning that's included in the box to not peel away the film, so make sure you don't do that or else you'll be damaging the OLED panel. Now, in terms of the overall color accuracy of this monitor, it's actually pretty impressive. It's worth considering here that there is a dedicated sRGB mode that you can enable via the monitor's OSD, and furthermore, you've actually got full brightness controls, which is always appreciated. Now, via said mode, I had its gamut coverage tested at 95.9% and its gamut volume at 98.7%. Below, you can see how it compares to the sRGB standards. As for the average LTE, it sits at 1.43 and a maximum of 3.89, therefore meaning that it can be used for serious image editing work. Its tested contrast ratio is infinity to 1 thanks to the OLED panel, and as for its measured white point, it sits at 6,248 Kelvin at 100% in comparison to the 6,504 Kelvin target. As for its gamma curve, here's how it compares to the 2.2 standard. Now aside from its sRGB color performance, the monitor does actually have a wider color gamut. And here with the sRGB mode disabled while being in the standard mode preset, I had its gamut coverage and gamut volume positively affected in the Adobe RGB and DCI-P3 modes. Below you can see how it compares to the DCI-P3 standard. And furthermore over here, the average LTE in comparison to the DCI-P3 color space sits at a very impressive 1.23 with a maximum of 3.46. So yes indeed, it can also be used to edit in the DCI-P3 color space. 
As for its measured white point, it slightly shifts at 6208 Kelvin at 100%. And with its gamma set at 2.6 Vidi monitors OSD, you can see here that it sits pretty close to the 2.6 standard, which is required for the DCI-P3 color space. Past the color test, let's talk about brightness. And here in HDR, I clocked in 483 nits. However, in SDR, it does get a lot dimmer at 184 nits, therefore making it a little less usable in a bright sunlit room. Thankfully, however, if you're going to be using this monitor in a completely pitch black room, then you'll be pleased to know that its brightness gets all the way down to 0.86 nits, which is actually stonkingly low. Now, in terms of the overall brightness uniformity, you'll be able to see how my tested panel performed. Of course, do bear in mind it's somewhat panel lottery. And as for the overall backlight bleed, well, it's non-existent. Thanks to the fact that it has got a OLED panel technology, it means all of the panel can be switched off and you'll be left with a completely pitch black image. Moving on, let's talk about its build quality. And here you've got a four side boreless design and therefore the monitor won't take as much space on your desk as you might think. Now there is also a built-in stand, which is in part made from recycled material, which is certainly appreciated. It provides you a pretty sturdy feel and gives you height, tilt and swivel adjustment. Although given its overall size, it's no surprise that the monitor cannot be pivoted, in other words, rotated. If you do want this functionality, you can replace the built-in stand with a Visa compatible stand. For example, if you want to wall mount it. Now, looking at the back of the monitor, you would have noticed some LED lights. And indeed, this monitor has got a three-sided Ambiglow technology. It's not as bright as some of the other Philips monitors that I've tested, but it's still a worthwhile inclusion, as it projects and indeed gives you a little bit of extra immersion from the content that you're consuming. Now, this effect can be disabled fully or indeed adjusted via the monitor's OSD, which can be accessed via a small little joystick button found behind the monitor or via the included bundled remote, allowing you to adjust certain settings from afar. The monitor's OSD itself is actually very comprehensively laid out and provides you a plethora of different options. Now, as an extension to this, you do also have the Philips Smart Control software, which gives you all the same sort of settings and also gives you the ability to upgrade the firmware, which can be handy if any new features get added onto the monitor. Now, through the menu, you will have noticed an audio tab. And yes, indeed, the monitor has got two 10 watt built in speakers, and that's actually pretty impressive for a monitor. You've also got DTS audio technology with a few different EQ modes that you can select from. Personally, I would actually suggest the music mode, but of course you can tinker around with it if you so wish, or indeed go and disable it altogether and adjust it with its five band EQ. Now, if you do not want to output audio via the built-in speakers, you will be pleased to know that there's a 3.5 millimeter jack, therefore allowing you to plug in your headphones directly into the monitor. And this leads me on to connectivity. And here you've got four USB type A ports, two of which have got fast charging capabilities, useful for example for modern smartphones. Elsewhere, you have got two full bandwidth HDMI 2.1 ports and a singular DisplayPort 1.4 input and USB type C. Now, the latter will also deliver up to 90 watts of power, which is very much useful for those people connecting up to a laptop. Now on that note, the monitor has got a built-in KVM switch which for those people who are unaware means that you can effectively plug in your mouse and keyboard directly into the monitor and switch between sources, saving you from plugging and unplugging your peripherals each time. In my case, I've got a laptop connected over a USB type C to the monitor, and then I've got a desktop computer connected over a display port with the USB type B to type A cable. And therefore means I can switch between the two sources while still utilizing my mouse and keyboard. Very handy in certain scenarios, specifically if you're going to be using this monitor for productivity. So there we have it. Hopefully you've enjoyed my informative video and it's covered everything you need to know about the Philips Evnia 42 M2N 8900. I'll be curious to know what you make of it down in the comment section below. Now, if you have enjoyed this video, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been Totally Dubbed and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.